He has lectured around the world and uh, his PhD level textbooks are actually required reading at many of the top, uh, top physics labs. Dr. Kaku graduated from Harvard in 1968, summa cum laude, number one in his physics class. No surprise, huh? Received his PhD from the Uni University of California at Berkeley Radiation Lab in 1972. There's a place for you. Bet there are stories. Uh, he held a lectureship at Princeton University in 1973. Joined the faculty at the City University of New York, where he has been a professor of theoretical physics now for 25 years. His goal is to help complete Einstein's dream of a theory of everything. A single equation, he likes to say, no bigger perhaps than your thumb, which would unify all the fundamental forces in the universe. Dr. Kaku, welcome. Welcome. Well, I'm glad to be on your show, Art. It's been a while, huh? <laughs> it's great to hear that voice. It's been a very long while, yes, sir. And uh, it's been so many years, uh, Professor, that do you remember I said you're going to be the next Carl Sagan. Well, I remember, yes. I remember you said that. Yeah, and it, well, wasn't, it wasn't so long ago. <laughs> yeah, well, you are. <laughs> you, you've well, achieved that. I, you know, I can't turn on Discovery or, or any other science program and not see you. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're very welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's quite a talent being able to explain the inexplicable, huh? Mm-hmm. Yes. And there's so much to explain. Mm -hmm. There really is, and I, I, I've got one off the top that I've been thinking about and I want to ask you about, all right? Okay, Might fire as... away. All right, let's start with the really, actually, the hard stuff. Um, where is it? All right, here we go. In quantum theory, mm -hmm. certain, certain physical systems can become entangled, meaning mm -hmm. their states are directly related to the state of another object somewhere else. When one object is measured, and the Schrodinger wave function collapses into a single state, that's complicated, the other object collapses into its corresponding state no matter how far away the objects are, in other words, non-locality. Is that, is that a fair description? Uh, that's right. Um, Einstein hated this concept, but hey, he was wrong on this one. Oh, he was wrong? Uh, yeah, we measure the uh, we measure this effect in the laboratory all the time. That interactions are in fact non-local. Um, Einstein thought that the universe was local. That is, all effects are are transmitted to nearby objects, not objects over a distance instantaneously. But hey, what can I say? You know, we do this in the laboratory every day. Okay, but nobody understands. What it comes down to is this, really, folks. If you think of two particles and you get them together and they're flipping and flopping. Well, once, you've, once they've come together, their flips and flops are going to be exactly the same. It doesn't matter if one's in New York and one's in Moscow. Is that correct, Doctor? That's right. If you take two electrons and bring them together so they vibrate in unison, and then you separate them, an invisible umbilical cord um, connects them no matter how far they are separated. You can yep. separate them to the ends of the galaxy, and you vibrate one, and in some sense, the other one is aware of the fact that it's attached to an object on the other side of the galaxy. Amazing. That's impo yeah, ama um, well, more than amazing, I think Einstein said spooky something at a distance. Yeah, spooky action at a distance, said Einstein. Okay, but it's not possible. I mean, without communication of uh, A and B, how would they know to flip it and flop at exactly the same point? They're doing a dance together, but they're not communicating. Uh, well, in some sense, they are. Um, electrons spin up and down. So if you know that one electron is spin up, then its partner is going to be spin down. But if you separate mm -hmm. them and you measure the spin of one electron and it's down, then instantly, faster than the speed of light, you now know that an object on the other side of the galaxy is spin up. Which is amazing. It's astounding. It, but oh, it's amazing and astounding. But professor, I'm a ham radio operator, and I can transmit 1,500 watts through a very effective antenna from from here to Moscow, let's say. Mm -hmm. And and um, and I'm going sublight, not light speed, but sublight, a little bit. Uh, and 
so there is communication, but it takes me a big transmitter, a giant antenna, and I may or may not be heard in Moscow. Uh, my point is, how are these things, how are they talking? Well, we don't know. Um, we just know uh -huh. that uh, spin is conserved, so that if one electron is spin up, the other one is spin down, so the total sum is zero. But if you separate them, the memory, the memory of them being attached stay with, stays with them, even though you separate them over light years. And if you measure one being spin up, the other one is automatically spin down. And you mm -hmm. now know that faster than the speed of light. Now, Einstein, of course, hated that idea, going faster than the speed of light. But we do this in the laboratory. Now, there is a catch, however. Einstein, in some sense, has the last laugh. It turns out that the information you send across this process is random information. That is, you cannot send Morse code this way. But in some sense, everything is entangled. Every atom of your body, in some sense, is entangled with another atom on the other side of the galaxy. Okay, Which is but amazing if you think about it. It is, but the bottom line is still we don't fully understand it at all, right? Right. However, quantum teleportation, a la Star Trek, is a direct consequence of this effect. And this has now been demonstrated at the University of Austria, also Caltech, University of Maryland, many places. And uh, quantum teleportation, a la Star Trek, that is uh, teleporting Captain Kirk from one place to another, may eventually be possible. We already teleport atoms now. Uh, individual atoms can also be connected doing, using this method of entanglement so that, uh, you know, the atom here can exchange information to another atom on the other side of the galaxy. So we can teleport atoms, yes? Yes, we teleported photons. Uh, the world's record is, I think, 600 meters for teleporting photons. And we now can teleport atoms, uh, cesium atoms, rubidium atoms. This is now something that we do in the laboratory. Okay, well, let me um, just wait until they've really got it down before I volunteer for an entire body move. Um, here's what I wanted to ask you, the build-up to all this. Here's where it is, and this is going to take you out of your comfort zone a little bit. But boy, I was sitting here thinking about all of this, the quantum story you just told. And then I thought about twins. You know, people who were twins. You know, I've been off on this for years now, this consciousness kick. I think, I think, Professor, consciousness may be, may have a quantum link. I know that's a terrible jump for you, but I, I have this feeling, and, and my example would be twins. Sometimes you've got a twin on one side of the world feeling pain when the other side of the, 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 you know, the twin on the other side of the world has something awful happen to it. And I've just got this funny feeling there's a quantum connection. What say you? Well, you know, some of the greatest minds of quantum mechanics, like Eugene Wigner, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize, he helped to build the atomic bomb. He believed that the quantum theory proved that there has to be a cosmic consciousness. And the reason for that is as follows. Uh, when you do this measurement, um, you don't know whether an object is spin up or spin down until you look at it. Right. So the observation process, in some sense, determines its state. And this means that since observation requires consciousness, only conscious beings can make measurements, we think, right? This means that consciousness is required to make an observation. And this goes back to what is called the Schrodinger cat problem. Yes. Where if I put a cat in a box and I attach a gun to the cat so the gun can kill the cat, is the cat dead or alive? Well, before you open the box, we physicists have to add the wave function of a dead cat to the wave function of a live cat. The cat is neither dead nor alive. When you open the box, then you say, aha, the cat is alive. Mm. So this means that observation that is opening the box, in some sense, determined that the cat was alive. I don't, I, I follow everything up to the point where you said it determined. Right, in other words, we don't know whether the cat is dead or alive until you open the box and make an observation. Before that, right. it's in Never Neverland. It's in a mixture of two states. Right, now, you but may how, did your, you, how did your observation, how did your observation determine which it was? Well, the state uh, can either be alive or dead before you open the box. Right. When you open the box, the so-called so wave function collapses. So it then degenerates into a live cat or a dead cat. 
before it yes. has a choice. Once you open the box, it's either dead or alive. So the observation process determined the fact that it exists in a certain state. So even though this sounds bizarre, this is the way electrons work, and that's why we have laser beams. Uh, laser beams are a direct consequence of this. You know, why are laser beams so bizarre and so strange? It's precisely because the laser beam is a quantum effect. All right, but I, I hate this, but I, I still don't get how my opening the box and observing that the cat was alive mm -hmm. helped the cat be alive. Uh, it, it's a 50-50 prop. It could have been dead, too, right? And I, I observed right. that. That's right. It could have been dead as well. But the fact that when you open the box, you now know the state of the cat, okay? That means that observation collapsed the wave. So the wave is no longer oscillating between being dead and alive. The wave That's has true. to choose. The wave has to choose whether the cat is dead or alive. Well, that would be the wave choosing, not me. Uh, yeah, we don't choose ahead of time the fact that the cat okay. is alive. Okay. We don't choose. It's the observation okay. process that, that chooses it. So by opening the box, you now know the cat is, let's say, alive. We can't choose that it's alive. It's a 50-50 either alive or okay. dead. Okay, now I get it. Right. And this works for electrons, and it works for transistors, and that's why your laptop works. You know, why is it that transistors and laptops are so miraculous and do so many crazy things? It's precisely because of this effect. If uh, quantum mechanics were turned off, uh, lasers would no longer work. Uh, the satellites we have in outer space wouldn't work. The internet would collapse. All modern electronics would grind to a halt if the quantum mechanical interpretation is turned off. So we live the quantum theory every single second you're online. Wow. Okay. All right. Let's change gears. I'm sorry. I, I just had to ask about that. And there's <laughs> one, one other thing. Yeah. Remember, we've got a big new audience here. We're on Sirius XM. So if you would run through the various types of civilizations that, that I know you, uh, you, you measure, or you, it's a way of measuring, I guess. Uh, and uh, again, we are, before we even begin, we remain, I take it, a type zero. That's right. We physicists like to measure everything in terms of energy. That's how we quantify things, including civilizations in outer space. So if you look at outer space, there must be three types of civilizations, type one, type two, type three, depending upon energy output. Eventually, a civilization becomes planetary. They control the oceans, they mine uh, the, they can mine the earth, they can mine the ocean, they control the weather. So they control all planetary energy like volcanoes and earthquakes. That's type one. Type two is they've exhausted the power of a planet and they start to, to mobilize the power of a star. They play with stars like Star Trek. The Federation of Planets would be a very typical type two civilization <laughs> where they've colonized just a few star systems. Then eventually you exhaust the power of a star and you go to the galaxy. That's type three, where you roam the galactic space lanes, like the empire of Empire Strikes Back. So we have planets, stars, and galaxies. But recently I was speaking in uh, London and a little kid comes up to me and he says, Professor, you're wrong. There's gotta be type four. And I said, oh. well, you're crazy. There's no such thing as type four. There are only planets, stars, and galaxies. And he said, no, it's type four, the power of the continuum. And then I realized, yeah, there is something beyond galactic power, and that's dark energy. And that's the continuum. <laughs> that's the power of the Q. And I realized, oh, my God, there really is an extra galactic source of energy out there, dark energy, which actually makes up about 73% of the universe's energy. So and dark this, matter? Yeah, How well, much, dark matter is in there. And now on this scale, what are, what are we on this <laughs> scale? We are type zero. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal, right? But we do, we do deserve to call ourselves a civilization, yes? Yes, we are type zero. And we're about 100 years from being type one. If you just get a calculator and calculate the energy output of the Earth, uh, we're about a type a zero in about 100 years will be type one. So we are now making the historic transition to type one. So what is the internet? The internet is a type one telephone system. 
we're privileged to be alive to see the birth of a beginning of a type one technology called the internet the language that these people will speak uh, well today the two dominant languages of the internet are english and mandarin so we are already beginning to see a type one language soccer and um the olympics is beginning of a type one sports uh the european union nafta we see the beginning of a type one economy quick question um do you think that in a hundred years english will still be part of a type one civilization probably be the dominant language um everywhere i go around the world uh people speak english to each other i, I could go to vietnam and see chinese vietnamese and laotian physicists and they all speak english to each other because there's no common language in asia other than english and the same thing in europe you can go to a conference in europe among scientists and they all speak english business finance arts everyone speaks english okay that's comforting we'll be here or at mm -hmm. least our language that's right. And the question is whether or not we're going to be here. <laughs> that's, that's the big question, Mark. Uh, um, actually, you know, in the old days when I interviewed you about this, mm -hmm. I asked you about the odds of um, either A, being destroyed as a type zero, or B, uh, making it to type one and, you know, popping the corks on champagne. But uh, I don't know. I've, I've got this feeling that you probably haven't changed your mind. What are the odds that we make it successfully to type one without destroying ourselves? Well, this is the most historic transition in the history of our civilization, the transition from type zero to type one. And it's not guaranteed that we're going to make it because mm. we have global warming, nuclear proliferation, the spread of biochurns. We, we have uh, threats we, we create ourselves. And so it's not clear. However, I'd say 50-50 now. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic oh than I was when I first talked to you. I should say, that's a yeah. big change. Yeah, that I think that so. makes me feel better. I feel a lot better now. Yeah, and no, I think 50-50 that, uh, you know, we have a fighting chance that, that we'll make it to <laughs> type one. Okay, look, it wasn't that long ago that we spoke. Now, between then and now, what's encouraged you? Well, you know, the economy collapsed, it did. and we hit rock bottom, but it hey, did. you know, we're still here, right? Appear to be. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were in denial about so many, uh, so many of these problems back then, but now, you know, they dominate the headlines, you know, global warming and, you know, nuclear proliferation, stuff like that. People are beginning to get aware of, of some of these things. And so um, I think that uh, that's going to be good. And, you know, democracy is spreading because of the Internet. Look at Arab Spring and look at the spread of, of uh, democracy because of the Internet. And democracies do not war with other democracies. Uh, you know, think of every war that you've learned since you were in grade school. Mm -hmm. They've always been between kings, queens, emperors, and dictators, but never between two democracies. And so as the Internet spreads democracies, democracies don't war with other democracies and so i think we will have wars in the future but they're going to be less wars less ferocious and less common as the spread of democracy takes hold the big loser in all this i think are dictatorships uh, dictatorships thrive on the ignorance of their own people and i think uh you know to be a dictator is to be an endangered species I would have to agree. I mean, recent history certainly proves that, right? So Yeah, yes. that's what the glimmer of hope. Uh, I'm not quite as pessimistic as I was before. <laughs> I see the spread of democracy. Uh, people are becoming more aware of these problems, and uh, democracies debate these problems, and uh, they confront them, and they don't war with each other. That's optimism, all right. Um, by the way, what about the little trips that we've had along the way? I mean, you know... Big earthquakes, nuclear reactors going bonkers. Yeah, well, it's not clear that we are going to make it. I mean, look at uh, yeah. Fukushima, right? Uh, th that's yes. a disaster that no one predicted. Three simultaneous meltdowns. You realize that the core at the Fukushima liquefied? We've never seen liquefaction of a nuclear reactor core before. Actually, and I think it was three of them, right? Three of them, right. Three liquefactions yes. of, of molten uranium. And do you realize that uh, we still have not controlled it? Uh, they, they could spiral out of control any day. A small little earthquake, and the reactor accident starts up all over again. Professor, hold tight right there. I, I'm, I'm going to hold you right there for a second and uh, talk 
about one other sea crane product. Professor, um, before <laughs> Fukushima, um, what are the possibilities, uh, both, you know, good and, and bad? Well, you know, nuclear energy had so much promise uh, decades ago. Uh, many futurists predicted that by the year 2000, we would have a thousand reactors and a thousand breeder reactors in the United States. Right. Now we're lucky to just have a hundred ordinary reactors and we have zero breeder reactors. So there's been a collapse of nuclear energy in the United States. However, in Japan, we have something even worse. Uh, right now we have this raging uh, meltdown that's in a temporary stasis. Uh, right now, every single nuclear power plant in Japan is shut down. Every single one. Zero energy output from nuclear energy right wow. now. Wow. So it's causing a national crisis. Uh, you know, that's the third largest economy on the planet. And uh, all of a sudden, one of their main sources of energy is, uh, is shut off. So it's, it's caused a tremendous amount of disruption. And the cleanup will take about 40 years. 40 years. Uh, Chernobyl, by the way, back in 1986, it's still going on. Uh, you realize the core is still still melting its way through the earth in outside Kiev, and uh, that's that's been uh, uh, what 25, 25 years in the making. So it'll take about forty years to clean up the Fukushima disaster. All right. On behalf of my wife and others, I want to ask this: I, when it happened, when Fukushima happened, I was in the Philippines. You know, and we were worried to death. Oh, the radiation is going to come this way. Of course, it went toward the U.S. instead. Uh, because that's where the prevailing winds, I guess, take it. Now, here's my question. They're pouring all of this water on the reactors to keep them from further, I guess, meltdown. And this water is running off. They're trying to capture it as best they can, but they're not doing a really good job. A lot of it's leaking into the Pacific Ocean. That's yes? right. TEPCO, the utility, has now admitted that they bungled the cleanup operation. Uh, 300 tons worth of radioactive water, we think, have spilled into the outside environment and probably into uh, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, right. The Korean government is now threatening uh, not to purchase any more fish uh, from Japan because of this crisis. This is going to escalate uh, as a consequence of this. And TEPCO, unfortunately, is sort of like, uh, you know, the Three Stooges operating a nuclear power plant. Uh, mm -hmm. Moe, Larry, and Curly uh, chasing each other around the control room, hitting each other over the head. Uh, we have a bunch of incompetence running that nuclear power plant. Um, I think that eventually the government's going to have to take over and do what Gorbachev did back in 1986. And that is call out uh, the military. It, it was a military operation that finally got the Chernobyl under control. And I think the Japanese government may have to do something similar. Admit that utility is totally outclassed, outgunned, and uh, they should perhaps bring in the military. Wow. Uh, Self-defense forces or U.S. military? Uh, Self-defense forces. Um, you realize that they handle global, it? Uh, a quarter of a million people were involved in that cleanup operation. A quarter right. of a million people. It was the largest engineering feat of its type ever. And a lot of them died. A lot of them died, too, right? Uh, the initial, uh, the firemen and uh, the initial emergency crews, yeah, they died a horrible, horrible death. Uh, you know, skin falling off, hair falling off. Uh, uh, they had a um, lethal dose of radiation in the initial, initial day of the Chernobyl accident, yeah. Um, so is that what they're facing in Japan? I mean, are there some jobs that are so damn dangerous that uh, if, if they start a real cleanup and send in the military, there's going to be people that will not live through the experience? Uh, yeah, well, at um, Chernobyl, uh, many people were sent in just for a few minutes, just for a few mm. minutes to do these very important tasks. Uh, robots, for example, cannot do these tasks. Uh, no matter how many science fiction movies we've seen with robots in them, uh, robots can barely turn a screwdriver. And so um, robots have been a total failure at uh, Fukushima. And as a consequence, the Pentagon, the U.S. Pentagon, has now set up a, cr a crash program to develop robots that can actually turn screws and uh, turn valves. And robots news. have been a giant failure worldwide anyway. I, I mean, when I was a yeah. kid, we all thought, oh, man, robots will be doing the dishes and cleaning the rugs and everything else by the time we're grown up. Yeah, no, robots have the intelligence of an insect, like a cockroach, um, mm. uh, a retarded, lobotomized cockroach. 
right. <laughs> um, they're very slow, the robots we have at MIT. Okay? And, you know, you put them inside Chernobyl, and all they do is get lost. Can I, can I just stop you for one second and ask why? Why have we made uh, not made more strides in robotics? Uh, we made a mistake 50 years ago. We thought that the brain is a computer. But you see, the brain is not a digital computer. There's no Windows. There's no Pentium chip. There's uh -huh. no software. There's no programming. There's no subroutines. Uh, the brain is not a digital computer. It's a learning machine. It's called a neural network. It learns and it changes itself after it learns, right? Now, your laptop today is just as stupid as it was yesterday. Because laptops never change. They never learn anything. And that's the difference between a digital computer robot and a human brain. The brain does one thing, learn, okay? It doesn't right. compute. It doesn't add. It doesn't subtract like what ordinary robots do. Robots my, my, my Windows 7 does not learn. Right. And, you know, robots are adding machines, very sophisticated. So it gives you the appearance that it's thinking, but it's actually not thinking at all. It's just right, adding. Right, right. While we are learning machines. And uh, that's why at uh, Fukushima, we have robots that can't even turn a screwdriver. It's, it's well, that bad. So they're no good. Um, so are people going to lose their lives trying to get Fukushima under control eventually? Is that I what hope, it comes to? I hope it doesn't happen that way. But, uh, you know, if they do what the Russians did, uh, they'll order, order, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to go in just for a few minutes apiece and turn the screws and open the valves and begin the cleanup operation. Mm -hmm. You realize they keep dumping cold water on the reactor and it flows out because the loop is not closed. I it's know. an open loop. I and know. until they close the loop, they're going to dump more water and create more radioactive water as a consequence. All right. All right. Uh, what about the fish? What about the sea life? What about the ocean? You're an environmentalist uh, as well as everything else. So how bad is it? Uh, well, that's what we're fearful of. Uh, you know, cesium, strontium, and iodine occur in water-soluble form. And uh, they will eventually wind up in, into the food chain. Uh, in fact, even in Tokyo, uh, some housewives bring Geiger counters when they go shopping. Uh, there are hot spots, uh, hot spots outside the evacuation zone of Fukushima, uh, you know, because it rains and the radiation was distributed unevenly. There are hot spots. Uh, and um, as you get closer to Fukushima, there are dead zones, you know, areas that, just like at Chernobyl, uh, will be off limits for centuries to come. And it does mean that we have to inspect the fish uh, because strontium, iodine, cesium will accumulate in muscle tissue and different kinds of organs of, of the fish. So it is something that has to be monitored. So far, so good. So far, there has been no major dumping of radioactive waste, but right. hey, it could happen. It's, it's seeping slowly, but so far we have not yet seen a catastrophic reach of, of the water. Okay. Uh, professor, if you were a one-man committee uh, in charge of deciding what the world needs to do uh, with nuclear power and nuclear power plants and, and where we go as a world from here for energy, um, what would your advice to the world be uh, with respect to nuclear power? Well, I think every country has to decide for itself, but the Germans have decided and they've thrown in the towel. Uh, nuclear power is going to be phased out in Germany. Also, Switzerland, uh, they both have phased out uh, nuclear energy. Italy is, is teetering. Uh, Japan, every poll shows that the people do not want nuclear. But, of right. course, something has to replace it, right? Yes. And right, right now, there's no single white knight. We would like to go with solar and renewable technology and clean technology. But solar is more expensive. Uh, and we're going to have to reduce the cost of solar. Now, further down the line, I think maybe within five to ten years, in that framework, uh, solar power gets cheaper and cheaper and slowly becomes more competitive uh, with oil and coal. But on a ten-year time frame, fusion becomes possible. Uh, the French are bidding the store on the ITER fusion reactor uh, that will hopefully go online in ten years or so. It'll and be safe? Uh, well, we don't know because we've never had an operating fusion reactor before, but mm. fusion reactors do not melt down. Uh, meltdowns are caused by nuclear waste. The, the heat emitted from nuclear waste causes meltdowns. While fusion okay, reactors, let, let, let me try this. Yes, if a fusion reactor goes wrong, what do we have? Uh, well, nothing, because it shuts itself off. Um, oh, good. 
uh, a fusion reactor has to attain what is called Lawson's criterion. Lawson's mm-hmm. criterion you have to have the right density, the right temperature to get fusion off the ground. The sun does it, uh, hydrogen bombs do it, and a fusion plant also has to attain uh, Lawson's criterion. But if you have a leak, then the Lawson's criterion is no longer satisfied, and it shuts off. So the, the fusion plant basically shuts off. It doesn't melt like a conventional nuclear fission plant because it has no nuclear waste. Dare I ask, so nothing can go wrong? Well, there's always something that can go wrong, <laughs> but not on the scale of fission. You know, fission reactors that use uranium are not found in nature. Mother Nature does not use uranium at all. Uranium is only found on the planet Earth for fission reactors. Mother Nature uses fusion, which is clean, recyclable. Uh, right. That's what Mother Nature uses, fusion. Well, um, with Russia in mind, and before, you know, you know, uh, before Fukushima, I was kind of a proponent of nuclear energy, and I think, if you'll excuse the expression, it was beginning to gather steam again until Fukushima. But right now, I I think most people uh, are probably going to say no, thank you, which means we better get moving on something else, eh? Yeah, I think so. I think we should start to look at other forms of energy. Uh, I think for the next 10 years, uh, there's going to be a flux. Uh, No one single white knight is going to emerge in the next 10 years. Uh, Right now, fossil fuels are as cheap as they've been because of, um, you know, shale and fracking. So Mm -hmm. that's uh, given some industrial nations breathing space. But I think that eventually, in a 10-year time frame, uh, renewables, solar, hydrogen will become competitive with fossil fuels. And again, 10 years from now, fusion starts to be in the mix. And so I think uh, in the next 10 years, we're going to see chaos. Uh, the atmosphere is going to get worse with global warming. We're going to dump more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But in a 10 plus year time frame, there's some good news in the sense that uh, renewable technology becomes cheaper and fusion becomes a possibility in, in that time frame. Is fracking safe? Well, so far, so good. You know, so far we hadn't had a major disaster with regards to uh, the fracking, which requires, of course, fracturing uh, some of the strata deep underneath the ground. Um, however, earthquakes. you know, uh, maybe the worst case scenario will be fulfilled at some point. You know, when oil was discovered, no one thought we would have gigantic super tankers that would spring a leak and pollute huge chunks of the coastline, right? Right. So we definitely could have another disaster with fracking, but so far, so far, so good. Okay. We haven't even talked about the stuff you came on the air to talk about yet, so let's do that. (laughs) Uh, I love to talk about anything with you. (laughs) (laughs) I I do, too. Exoplanets, um, my goodness, in just the short years that we have not talked, they have discovered so many planets that are kind of like Earth, huh? Yeah. It's amazing how many of them. That's right. Two a week, right? Oh, my God, two a week. And that means somewhat Earth-like, Yes. Uh, yeah, that's right. Last time we talked, you know, we were just hoping that we would be able to identify planets way out there orbiting other stars. Now we've right. identified 2,000 planets, and now we, you can, we can take a census of the Milky Way galaxy. This is, this is a first. We've never been able to do this before. We now a realize census. that over 50% of all stars at night you see the Milky Way have planets of some sort. Over right. 50% of all stars have planets. And of them, we think that maybe one out of every 200 has an Earth-like planet. That means in our own backyard, the Milky Way galaxy, with about 200 billion stars, we have about a billion Earth-like planets in our own backyard. This is astounding. It is astounding. Um, And it begs the question, where the hell are they? Yeah, well, that's the Fermi paradox. Um, I have my own point of view. And that is, if they can visit us from these fantastic distances, right, hundreds and hundreds of light years, they're probably type 2, or more likely type 3. And, uh, you know, our galaxy could be teeming with information being exchanged by different type 3 civilizations, right? There could be a a galactic empire. We could be in the middle of it. Yeah, and we're ants. We're nothing but ants. They haven't even noticed we're here yet. That's right. We could be in the middle. We could be in the middle of this intergalactic communication network, and we're so primitive that we don't even know it. <laughs> so 
sad. Yeah, they passed this little green blue orb and just kept on going. Nothing there. Nothing of significance anyway. Yeah, I mean, what right. makes us think that we, we are so arrogant that they're going to want to land on the White House lawn? <laughs> Give me a there, is, there, there is one other uh, somewhat negative possibility, though, mm-hmm. sir, and that is that uh, nobody ever gets to be a type one. Yeah, the other flip side of this is that perhaps type zero civilizations are common, like us, yeah. but they never make it to type That's one. Right. They self-destruct. Right. So when we have starships and visit these planets one day, we may see atmospheres that are radioactive, atmospheres that are super hot, atmospheres with germs in them, uh, because they had warfare and they polluted their planet. And Mm. uh, perhaps that's a warning that we are now on the verge of becoming type one. We're making the historic transition, the first time in civilization, from one type to another type, and we may not make it. Um, I, you know, at best, you're giving us 50-50 to make it to type one now. And, yeah. and that's pretty good compared to what you were giving. Like, oh, it was yeah, more yeah. like one in a hundred. Right. One in a hundred. So right. we but, certainly have made progress, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, on a good day, I'm with you. 50-50 on a bad day, no way. Yeah, but, you know, look, look at the spread of democracy. I mean, you know, when I open the newspaper, I can't believe, I can't believe what's happening. People taking to the streets. I mean, people taking control over their own future. You know, I mean, uh, this was unheard of during the Cold War. During the Cold War, the world was frozen, frozen solid during the Cold War, right? It's true. We're a solid notch above that. Yeah, and so people are now taking their own destiny in their own hands. And so I think that's a, that's a real positive, uh, real positive statement. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, once governments become democratic, people worry about sewer systems and taxations and how to educate their kids. Mm-hmm. They don't want to glorify the king. They don't want to sacrifice their kids to mm-hmm. some, for some unnamed war in some unnamed continent, right? right? They want a good life for their kids. Right. But I still would like to meet more point eight type people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to throw that in. Um, okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, I guess there's a lot of planets out there, and uh, we're looking, I guess we're looking harder and harder. Uh, what's the deal with Kepler? Uh, yeah, well, unfortunately, Kepler is, uh, is a satellite that discovered thousands of these planets, and it's crippled right now. So unfortunately, it's not stable. It cannot lock on to planets and make the delicate instrument, uh, delicate uh, measurements that it used to. However, there's enough data for us to analyze it for years to come. And uh, Kepler only looked at a fragment, a fragment of the Milky Way galaxy and found thousands of uh, planets uh, and about, you know, 1% or so of them are Earth-like. And so we may find a twin of the Earth in outer space, perhaps this year or next year, at the rate at which we're going. This year or next year, somebody's going to announce that we have found a twin of the Earth, same size, uh, same characteristics, uh, perhaps with liquid oceans. And uh, that could be a game changer. Think about that. A twin of the Earth. It it could, but again, where are they? I mean... I, I want radio or TV or some, uh, for example, will we ever have a instrument, even in space, delicate enough to detect any sign at all of civilization, even if they're not trying to communicate? Well, it's not clear. I mean, it seems to me that a civilization that advanced, they use lasers to communicate with each other rather than radio. Oh. And our, our satellites and the heart detection system are not equipped are not equipped to to look for extraterrestrial laser uh, communications. And no. You know, I've heard that um, they're beginning to think about looking for laser bursts from another civilization somewhere. Is that a likely prospect? Uh, that's also possible because, um, you know, the way in which we send information may not be the way they send information. Right. Uh, if your message is going to be scrambled across supernovas and gas clouds, uh, you want redundancies, and you want to spread your signal around a bit, and uh, you want to pulse it. And so, yeah, these, the, these messages being sent by extraterrestrials could be on a totally different kind of frequency. They could be uh, spread over several different frequencies. They could be pulsed. 
there are many ways that they can increase the efficiency of transmission through gas clouds and, and supernovae. But we are looking for hydrogen frequency messages, right. which is stupid if you think about it. Why should aliens communicate with radio on a hydrogen frequency? <laughs> if but that's what we one, do. Uh -huh. If you had one opportunity, uh, Professor, to communicate something to life that might be out there, what would you tell them about the human race? Well, first of all, I would not do what uh, other scientists have done, and that is to advertise our existence and to give our exact coordinates in outer space with regards <laughs> to the nearby stars. Yes. We don't know their intentions. No. I think their intentions are going to be good because, of course, if they're that advanced, there's plenty of uninhabited planets to plunder for natural resources. They don't have to bother with us. So I think they're going to be peaceful. However, on the small chance that they're not peaceful, I don't think we should advertise our existence. Where because they may are. pick up a medallion and say to themselves, lunch, let's go have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, glad to be on. An honor. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, it's an honor to have you. Um, Higgs boson. Uh, the Higgs particle, I saw a special on it, I, I think the other day. And it showed uh, people like yourself and many others in a giant auditorium going, you know, yeah, hey, we found it. We found it finally. The Higgs particle, the God particle, it was called, I believe, right? That's right. Uh... Mm -hmm. um, but how they found it was really weird. In other words, the, the giant Hadron Collider, or large one, I guess they call it, um, found it, but they found it not by seeing it, but like seeing where it was. In other words, they made it and it existed for a zillionth of a second and disappeared. So all they did was look at the clutter around it and said, ah, ha, 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 there it was Higgs. Is that about right? Yeah, it's like taking a piano and throwing it out of a 10 story building and listening to the crash of the piano. And then from the sound, reconstructing what the piano was made of. That's what we physicists have to do. We take protons, smash them like a, like a piano thrown from a 10-story building, look at the debris, and then run the videotape backwards. When you run the videotape backwards, then you try to reassemble the piano as it impacts on the ground to reconstruct what the piano looks like. That's how we found the Higgs boson. We smash protons together at trillions of electron volts, look at all the garbage coming out, run the videotape backwards to the instant of the collision, and then we say, aha, bingo, we see it. There's the Higgs boson. <laughs> okay, um, so it's definitely found. You have no doubt in your mind? Yeah, no doubt in my mind. And the next, uh, the next particle to be bagged, uh, I should point out, beyond the Higgs boson is, ta-da, dark matter. We hope to actually create dark matter in the laboratory with the Large Hadron Collider. That's the next big animal that we're going to bag, we hope. <laughs> Can you actually, I mean, you can't really, well, I guess bag is a loose term, uh, but you couldn't take a bunch of uh, Higgs particles and bag them at all because you uh, yeah, and dark matter, as you know, is the, mo the strangest form of matter that we've ever, ever even uh, conceived of. First of all, it's invisible, so that if you held dark matter in your hand, it'd be invisible. Second of all, it goes right through you like a ghost. If you held dark matter in your hand, it would literally filter right through your fingers and go through the floor. Mm -hmm. It would is go it all the way... Hmm? Is it, I'm sorry, is it fair to say dark matter is all around us? Uh, we think it's all around us, right? Uh, we can't measure it directly because it is invisible and there's very little of it. If you held it in your hand, it would filter right through your hand down to China, reverse itself in China, and come back to the Earth and come back to where you're sitting in your living room, and then oscillate between your hand and China. Why? So dark matter is definitely some weird stuff. <laughs> wait, wait. Why would it do that? Because uh, of gravity. Uh, it has no electric charge, and therefore it goes right through matter as if it was a ghost. However, it does obey gravity, and so like, like a ball bouncing back and forth, uh, it'll go all the way to China, stop, reverse itself, and come all the way back to, well, New York, where I am, and oscillate between New York and China, as if wow. the Earth weren't there. That's I mean, amazing. Dark matter is some pretty freaky stuff. <laughs> um. 
Yes, it is. And it's a perfect title for this program, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, so, you actually think we're going to be able to create... That's the hope. Matter, yes? uh, we're not sure that the Large Hadron Collider is powerful enough, because we are, in fact, you know, we're, we're recreating Genesis. We're recreating uh, the, the instant of the creation of the universe with this machine. And we're not clear that the Large Hadron Collider is large enough to do this. But, uh -huh. uh, you know, we have our hopes, and we think that the next animal we want to bag beyond the Higgs boson is dark matter. And there's a whole shelf full of Nobel Prizes waiting for the young physicists who can figure out what dark matter is. You know, every high school textbook is wrong when they say that the universe is mainly made out of atoms. We now know that's wrong. Uh, the universe, as far as matter is concerned, is mainly made out of dark matter. Um, is, atoms is it only possible? Is, I'm sorry. Is it possible, uh, Professor, that dark matter uh, would be a component of or part of the Higgs? Uh, we think that the Higgs is ordinary matter, um, in the sense that it interacts with the other particles uh, in a very standard way. Um, we think that dark matter is stable, but it has neutral charge, sort of like the neutron. Uh, the neutron also has neutral charge. Uh, it's unstable, so it disintegrates. Uh, however, dark matter is stable. It, you could, you know, put it on your table. It'll fall through the table, but, you know, you could temporarily put it on your table. Uh, neutrons are unstable, but neutrons would also be very ghost-like. Neutrons also have zero charge. Neutrons also would just filter right through objects as if they didn't exist, because they don't have any charge. So with a big enough collider, we're essentially, uh, re or we are creating, I guess would be the way to put it. When you bang these together hard enough, eventually, you're going to possibly end up so with something that approximates creation. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, we, we were supposed to have our machine outside Dallas, Texas, the Super Collider, but it was canceled uh, because uh, one congressman asked the physicist, among other things, uh, will we find God with your Super Collider? And the physicist said, no, we won't find God, but we'll find the Higgs boson. Well, all the jaws hit the floor in Congress. What? $10 billion for a goddamn subatomic particle. And they canceled our machine. Right. Now, I would have answered it differently. I would have said, God, by whatever signs or symbols you ascribe to the deity, this machine, the super collider, will take us as close as humanly possible to his greatest creation, and that is Genesis. This is a Genesis machine. It'll recreate on a tiny microscopic scale the instant of creation. That's what I would have said. However, we, we said Higgs boson, and the machine was canceled. <laughs> Are we really sure, Professor, that when we get really creative with one of these big colliders, we're not going to do something that we regret? Well, you know, I had lunch with um, a producer from the Science Fiction Channel one day, and I casually mentioned to him that, well, yeah, there are some people who might think that it's going to create a black hole that's going to swallow up the Earth, blah, blah, blah. But I mm. told him I didn't think so because, uh, you know, cosmic rays from out of space bathe the Earth with energies much greater than this pea shooter uh, called the Large Hadron Collider. But anyway, they ran with it, and they did a TV series, and it scared the hell out of people. <laughs> well, and look, Professor, sometimes very small things, and modern hydrogen bombs are actually pretty small if you want them to be, do really big things. And so uh, along that line of thinking, you have to allow at least a tiny probability of something really big happening from something from real, some really small collision, so Yeah, to speak. but you can measure that probability. Uh, we have cosmic rays in outer space that have much more energy than what we can, what we Earthlings can attain on the planet Earth. And the Earth is bathed, bathed in the radiation from these collisions, you know, like black mm -hmm. holes colliding with other black holes, mm -hmm. far beyond what the Large Hadron Collider can produce. And hey, we're still here. So the very fact so, that we're here is proof that the probability is near zero that the Large Hadron Collider is dangerous. Near zero? Near zero, but, right. Okay, Large Hadron Collider, but maybe the next collider or the one after it. In other words, at some point, as we progress, and we always progress, um, isn't it possible that some little thing, some little collision will have some really big effect, some big creative effect? 
Well, I think with nuclear energy, there is definitely that possibility because, uh, you know, you have 100 tons of nuclear waste stored in, in one small compartment. Um, however, the, there is talk about the next generation beyond the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, the Japanese government wants to stimulate its moribund economy. It has $10 billion to throw around. And they want to back the ILC, the International Linear Collider. And uh-huh. that's picking up a lot of steam now because the Japanese government is pushing it. It's a prestige pro- project, generate a lot of prestige for Japan, stimulate the economy because it is pork barrel. And uh, it's, to, it's to create the next generation of particles beyond the Large Hadron Collider, specifically dark matter. Mm-hmm. How big? Uh, well, it's going to be miles long. We have a linear collider out, outside uh, San Francisco at Stanford. It's two miles long. And this is going to be many multiples of that. Um, so it's going to be uh, miles and miles long, a linear collider that slams electrons into, into anti-electrons. And uh, we hope to find, you know, particles beyond the Higgs. That is... Okay, so for people who are not uh, collider familiar, that would be mm-hmm. most of us, um, what's the deal? The bigger the collider, miles and miles and miles and miles long, the, the faster the acceleration, the bigger the collision, what's the deal? Yeah, that's exactly right. You got it. Uh, the bigger they are, the, the faster they go, the more energy you get in the collision. And uh, then you're going backwards in time. It's a time machine because you're recreating matter that didn't exist since 13.7 billion years, since the beginning of the, of the universe. That was the Big Bang. So we're recreating on a tiny, tiny microscopic scale matter that didn't exist for 13.7 billion years since the beginning of the universe. So what we want to do is to figure out, you know, why the universe banged. What set off the universe? What was the match that set off the Big Bang? And well, that's, real, that's really meeting up with God, isn't it? Uh, that well, out. that's why they call it the God particle. <laughs> we are talking about the ultimate questions. Why are we here? Why does the universe exist the way it does? That's what the Higgs boson does. The Higgs boson, we think, is part of the fuse, the match, the match that lit the Big Bang. And that's why we call it the God particle. I tell you, man, this is deep stuff. It is. Um, and, but when you talk about the match, mm-hmm. um, that really makes it sound like, well, you know, when we've got the match and we've got it just right and we strike it, look out, baby. It's creation time. And, um, and you know, with that comes at least the probability of something really big. Yeah, but you have to realize that when the universe was set off, it was a pretty big lump of matter that, that detonated to create the universe. We're talking about itsy bitsy little teeny weeny large age on collider <laughs> compared okay, you're, you're, to the you're, universe. You're absolutely, you're absolutely sure, Professor, that it wasn't some point nine civilization uh, pushing the button on the big new shiny toy uh, really big collider and then you know, I mean, what if that's how come we're here? Uh, well, like I said before, Mother Nature is the biggest uh, accelerator of particles that we know of. Uh, the, they had, uh, Mother Nature has created an accelerator much bigger than the Large Hadron Collider, and it's called the Big Bang. Uh, the Big Bang is the biggest accelerator known to science, yes, but created look, by look, Mother look, Nature. Look, yeah, but look what happened. The it Big created Bang the universe. Was... Well, but yeah. we're, we're bathed by radiation from colliding black holes. Black holes weigh, you know, many millions of times more than the Earth. And when they collide, they release an enormous burst of radiation. And the Earth is bathed in that radiation. It's called cosmic rays. Right. And these cosmic rays are much, some of them are much more energetic than what we get with the uh, Large Hadron Collider. And hey, we're still here. <laughs> well, so that's why I say I mean, the probability is pretty much zero that it's going to be right. dangerous. Do, do you ever worry that one day you'll lake? you'll wake up and uh, and you'll suddenly hear from some astronomer somewhere that oh my god uh, we've just spotted two black holes uh, within our area of responsibility that appear to be headed for each other well I would worry more that they find a black hole that's headed our way that's wandering wandering black holes as, as we discussed earlier um, have been discovered and uh, they give you no warning they creep up on you and we were tracking one right now as it goes across the Milky Way galaxy. And that's, that's kind of scary stuff, because you would have no warning that a, that a black hole is about to eat up your entire solar system. 
it would eat up the earth and not even burp. Uh, it would eat up the sun, for that matter. And uh, we have very little warning because it's invisible. Uh, the only way we know that these wandering black holes exist is because starlight, starlight is distorted as it moves, sort of like the predator. Uh, when the predator in the movie moves across the background, it kind of distorts the background a little bit. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, that's how we know that these wandering black holes exist. That I would worry about. All right, so let's say you wake up one morning, you get a call from an astronomer, who, or many astronomers, who are suddenly saying, look, we have an increasingly large number of stars disappearing from the field that we're capable of viewing. Uh, in other words, something's headed apparently directly toward us. Yeah, I would worry about that. And uh, another worry is that when stars collide, they can re release a burst of radiation called a gamma ray burst. Right. And there's one a potential gamma ray burster headed our way uh, w, uh, WR-104, really? and we think that we are within the kill radius. Uh, we're, we're within the kill radius of this gigantic cosmic firecracker when it goes off. Really? Um, just Google it, WR-104, Google it. I'm writing that down right now, WR-104? Right, it's uh, two gigantic stars that are dying. They're in the death dance, chasing each other. What so we know, the, the we know the planes radius? of this. And it will undergo a gamma ray burst, which is the largest source of energy other than the Big Bang itself. And it could be headed our way. When uh, we don't know when it's going to detonate, though. It's a big question mark. I see. And if it did detonate, what would we... I don't know. I, I well, it would not be it. pleasant. What would we notice? Uh, well, it would not be pleasant. It would destroy not just the Earth. It would destroy most of the solar system. Uh, the radiation is the most intense since the Big Bang itself. Uh, we see these gamma ray bursts all the time now with our satellites, but usually they're headed the wrong way. They're not headed toward Earth. Here we have two stars that have not yet collided, and when they do collide and undergo gamma ray burst, it'll create a gigantic rifle bullet, and this rifle bullet is headed our way. Uh, there's a debate among astronomers as to how close it's going to graze the Earth, whether it will totally hit the Earth or graze the Earth. Uh, astronomers are not yet decided. It goes back I haven't and forth. heard about this debate. In fact, I haven't heard of WR-104 uh, or anything until just now. You're the one telling me about this. Yes, it's, um, it's something that we have to look at seriously. It's thousands of light years away. However, a gamma ray burst will go across uh, six to 8,000 light years. And anything in its path will be incinerated. The ozone layer of the atmosphere will be blown off, and uh, life forms will be scorched by ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So it's not going to be pleasant, and we don't know when it's going to go off. Uh, some people think that maybe it has already gone off, but you know it takes thousands of years for the light to, to hit us. But when the light hits us, it's going to scorch the Earth. So, so in other words, it, it would basically sterilize uh, well, or it, even that's worse. right. It, that's right. St and you know, sterilize, sterilize, professor, or worse. Uh, yeah, it, it'll scorch the earth. Uh, life forms as we know it uh, will die, and uh, you know, uh, the earth could be laid barren by this. And uh, you know, if you um, Google WR one hundred four, we have motion pictures of this thing. Motion pictures of the two stars in a death dance as they circle each other. And they will explode uh, by the laws of physics. By the laws of physics, it will undergo a hypernova of some sort. And it'll release, uh, like a rifle bullet, a burst of radiation to the North Pole and the South Pole. And we are in the, we are staring down the gun barrel. We're staring down the gun barrel of WR-104. What uh, brings the astronomers or yourself to the conclusion that the gun is pointed at us. Uh, well, we have the two stars circulating around each other, so we know the plane, uh, the plane of these two stars. And when they collide, therefore, we know the direction of the North Pole. And we're staring down the gun barrel. Holy smokes. However, you know, there's debate among astronomers. Back, and it goes back and forth, back and forth, as to how the close the, the beam is going gonna, gonna to graze the Earth or, or whether it's going to hit the Earth or not. But if it hits the Earth, there's not going to be much left of the Earth. Would there be... I mean, it's radiation, right? Uh, yep, it's that's not right. Gamma heat. radiation. Okay, radiation. 
So would could there be a project where the United States would dig under, I don't know, Ohio, and we'd have some great underground shelter to try to continue humanity, gee, just like a movie? Well, that's the only way of escape. Um, you cannot go into outer space because it'll scorch the entire solar system. Uh, you know, the gamma ray burst is going to be huge. Uh, these are stars our, space we're talking program, about. our space program is yeah. not to it anyway. Right. So, yeah, you're right. The only solution would be to go underground. And again, we don't know when it's going to. We don't know when it's going to fire, so we don't want to cause a panic. It may not fire so, for thousands of years, maybe millions be, of years. Would there be any warning whatsoever? Uh, very little, uh, because the warning itself would travel at the speed of light, uh, and the beam, of course, travels at the speed of light. Uh, we would see these two things begin to coalesce into one, and and then fire. Uh, okay, so there'd be a little warning of the of the imminent collision, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right, as, as we track it. And remember, we're looking at the past. We're looking at these stars as they were th thousands of light years, thousands of years ago. So this might have already occurred? That's right. Some people oh, think that maybe no. it's already occurred, except we're too right. stupid to know it. <laughs> right. Oh, I get it. I get it. Uh, yes, I do. Um, Far away. One of my RV and ham buddies and I both have volunteered at uh, Yellowstone. And uh, Dr. Kaku mentioned that uh, we can expect a big volcano eruption there at some time in the future. And since we go there quite often to uh, do volunteer work in the uh, open season, I wondered if he could give us any kind of uh, tips of things to look for that might uh, tip us off as to actions that uh, might be an indicator that this is about to happen. Okay, you're not like the crazy guy in 2012, are you? Uh, no, sir, not today. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> right. the, the, yeah, the radio broadcaster. Anyway, Professor? Uh, okay, well, first of all, when people think of Yellowstone, they think of Yogi Bear and the cartoons and stuff like that. Mm. But we have to realize that the Yellowstone, the Yellowstone Park is at the tip, the very tip of a super volcano. Most of it is underground. And it last erupted on the scale of hundreds of thousands of years ago. So the cycle time for these eruptions is measured in thousands of years. So, however, you know, according to one calculation, we are more or less due for another eruption. And when that happens, it could tear the guts out of the United States of America. Now, to look for telltale signs, uh, it turns out that volcano eruptions do have warning signs, unlike earthquakes. Uh, earthquakes can happen with very little warning. Right. However, with volcanoes, you have rumblings. Uh, you, you, you have stirrings within the volcano. Mm -hmm. And so with uh, seismographs and with the different chemical detectors to look for different kinds of uh, materials coming out of the volcano, you have telltale signs that something is happening, okay? Is now, something happening? Uh, well, right now, no. Uh, just two years ago, there was some concern that maybe something was building up, but mm -hmm. nothing came of that. But it is something that we have to uh, monitor, because if you do fast-forward the videotape, it, it will blow at some point. It's the law of physics uh, that it will blow. And when that happens, it's not going to be pretty at all. But again, it could be tomorrow, or it could be thousands of years in the future. The thing to do is to monitor it and to listen to it very carefully to see the frequency of eruptions, the severity, because uh, well, volcanoes, unlike earthquakes, do give you a warning. If you thought uh, that uh, Yellowstone was going to go in a big way, what would you do? Well, if the signs are there, um, you know, politicians always say, don't cause panic, you know, you'll cause disruption. But if it really does look like Yellowstone is, is getting ready for another super eruption, I think yes. you should uh, let the word out. Uh, people are going to have to evacuate. Look at Mount Vesuvius. Uh, the people there at Pompeii didn't have a chance. Um, they had very little warning. And uh, they, they were caught uh, right there, you know, 2,000 okay, years let, ago. Let's put it this way. You're in New York, right? Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. So if Yellowstone went, would you be concerned in New York? Uh, well, definitely. Uh, first of all, the volcanic ash is going to go hundreds, uh, thousands of miles. Uh, uh -huh. And, of course, uh, there's going to be mass evacuations. People are going to spontaneously get on their um, SUV and, and get, get out of the path as fast as they can. And... We're going to be affected uh, all the way in New York, definitely. Mm. I wouldn't be ideally situated here in Pahrump, Nevada, would I? 
Uh, well, it depends on which way the wind blows. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it could, uh, there could be a lot of chaos in the, in the very heartland of America. I saw 2012. It was bad for Vegas. Uh, yeah. And it's not going to be good for the United States of America if, uh, if uh, Yellowstone goes up. But again, we don't know when. It may be thousands and thousands of years into the future, or it may be tomorrow. It's just one of these things we have to live with. Okay. Um, hello there. Good evening. You're on the air with Art Bell and Professor Kaku. Dark Matter it is. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I have a question for Dr. Kaku relative to the theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. And I think one time before on Art's show, you simply explained it. And I wondered how that uh, relates to dark matter and uh, if it relates to dark matter. Um, and also talking about Mars and the space program, I, I was at lunch uh, last week in uh, Washington, D.C., and I was sitting next to um, Buzz Aldrin. Mm -hmm. I think you had him on, a, on your show uh, right. a long time ago, Art, and I asked him if he remembered that, and he says, yes, I do remember being on that show. But anyway, I've always, I've never, I'm a math major, but I've never understood the theory of relativity. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll see what we can do here. Uh, thank you very much for the call. Where are you, by the way? I'm in uh, northern Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. All right. Very good. Uh, so, Professor, relativity, um, anything to do with dark matter? Uh, okay. First of all, um, the, the relativity and dark matter are not directly related to each other. Dark matter, we think, yes. is a solution of relativity. But relativity makes different kinds of particles possible plus two charge, uh, minus two charge, plus one charge, different kinds of charges. Dark matter has zero charge. And as a consequence, we'll go right through ordinary matter, like a neutron. It's very difficult to stop a neutron because it has zero charge and doesn't interact electromagnetically with uh, the rest of matter. So relativity makes possible dark matter, but it does not determine the characteristics of dark matter. And really Explain, simply, if you would, explain relativity. Well, relativity violates common sense because we think that a second on the moon is a second on the Earth. We think right. that a yardstick on Jupiter is the same as a yardstick on the Earth. Relativity says no. Um, time beats faster on the moon than it does on the Earth. And our GPS satellites uh, also are a little bit slower in, in, in their clock, and we can measure this. So relativity gives you a very precise way in which you can determine how time slows down as objects speed up.